Hello, my name is Elisa Kaplan. Today is Tuesday, May 27th, 2014. It is my honor and privilege today to be interviewing Hirsch Lebo for the Veterans Project for the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. And this is being done by the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. Good morning, Hirsch. Good morning. Tell us briefly about your family. Where and when were you born? I was born uh, January the 20th, 1928, in Norwich, Connecticut. Uh, my mother, Betty Lebo, uh, she was born in what is now the Ukraine. It was then part of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and her uh, native language was Polish. She came over here when she was about nine years old with her mother. And uh, they lived in a one room uh, cold water flat. And uh, I remember her telling me she used to go down to the railroad tracks to get coal for the, in the wintertime for uh, heat. My mother later uh, went to school for about six years and then she went to work. Uh, she must have been about 15 or 16 at the time. She got a job at a millinery store, and she was very good. And they used to send her to New York on her own to buy uh, millinery stuff, whatever it was. And um, eventually, uh, oh yes, then she became a bookkeeper. And uh, later, uh, she and my father bought a liquor store in 1943, and that was to get enough money to send my sister and myself to uh, college. My father was born in uh, an area near Minsk, and his father, uh, my father's name was Louis, and uh, he, uh, his father, uh, Yehuda, ran a, a granary and uh, that was like the gas station of the uh, 1900s to feed animals and so forth. He told me when he was a boy, he remembered he could free tickets to the circus because they came to uh, his father to get grain for the animals. So he got a free ticket. Um, my family was really devoted to my sister and myself. They saw that we got everything possible uh, to make our life as comfortable as possible and they really encourage us to uh, get educated. Um, How did your parents choose Connecticut? Well, um, my mother had family here in the States in uh, Boston. So she didn't come in with her mother into Ellis Island. She came into Boston. And then they decided that uh, there was a cousin here in Norwich, Connecticut. And so they sent her with my mother, that is my grandmother, my mother, to uh, Norwich. And that's how they got started there. My father uh, came to the United States via Paris. He had a sister uh, who uh, was a, a dentist in Russia, and she got married to a cousin, a distant cousin, in uh, Paris. And they might immigrated to uh, New York. He was in the jewelry business. So my father first came over here, it was right, right after his uh, mitzvah. Uh, he didn't have any real uh, profession. Uh, he ended up going to the uh, Baron de Hirsch Agricultural School in uh, Woodbine, New Jersey, and uh, he got a certificate there, which I later, he gave to me, and I later gave to a cousin, Kenneth Lee, who uh, at the time was a curator of what later became the Jewish Museum in Philadelphia. And today, that certificate is in the Jewish Museum in Philadelphia. My father, uh, after his training at the uh, in agriculture, 
went to work for uh, uh, the uh, he went to work in Ohio uh, in the agricultural field uh, for uh, the people who owned the land there. Now one of the tires is named after them. Not Goodrich, but uh, can't remember the name. But anyway. Uh, he worked out there, and then the war started. He came back to New York uh, to do work. Uh, it wasn't government work, but it was essential work. So later on, he had trouble getting citizenship because he wasn't in the service. Yeah. But he eventually got citizenship. Uh, then uh, he uh, met his brother, who came over from uh, uh, Russia. And uh, that was an interesting story, too, because his mother, my, uh, my grandmother, uh, was afraid uh, that uh, her son would be inducted into the Russian army. So she went by train and bribing uh, Russian uh, conductors or police, whatever it was, to uh, lot of stock. And uh, they went across all of Russia because they lived in the West. And he got a ship, landed in uh, the West Coast, and then traveled to uh, the East Coast because his sister was there. So my uh, father, with his experience, my brother, they bought a farm in uh, outside of uh, Norwich called Lisbon, a town called Lisbon. And uh, they had uh, cows and uh, chickens and uh, they sold eggs and milk, and that's how he met my mother, because he was the milkman. <laughs> so, so you are the son of the milkman. The milkman, right. I couldn't resist that. Uh, you mentioned a sister. You ha yes. Tell us about your siblings. My sister is three years younger. She, a uh, wonderful woman. Uh, unfortunately, she lost her first husband, who was a dentist and a sweetheart from uh, childhood. And uh, th then uh, after a number of years she remarried and lost that husband too. But anyway, she has uh, two children. She went to what was the uh, New Britain Normal School, I guess, in those days. I guess today it's uh, New Britain Teachers College. And uh, she lives in New London. And. Uh, two children and four great-grandchildren. And was she a teacher? Uh, she was a teacher for a number of years, even while, uh, she, while she was married and afterwards. She's retired now. She does a lot of uh, volunteer work at the Lawrence Memorial Hospital in New London. And, uh, she's a regular uh, uh, shul-goer, uh, synagogue-goer, to make uh, millions. That's uh, my sister. She was a very kind, lovely, lovely woman. A any other <clears throat> siblings? No. The two of you. Sounds Just like, the two. Sounds like a lovely family. Yes, I think so. We want to find out about your military service. So, how did you happen to serve in the military? Uh, when I graduated from uh, medical school, the Korean War was on. And there was a plan called the Berry Plan. The, uh, this was named after the uh, then uh, dean of the Harvard Medical School, Dr. Berry. Uh, what they did was they allowed us to uh, serve our internship. And then you had to go into the service. Because you weren't too much of too much value uh, just getting out of medical school. So they let you get a year of uh, practice. Where did you go to medical school? I went to Tufts in Boston. And, uh, and I took an internship in Brooklyn, New York, because it was part way between, or as close as possible, between my home in uh, Connecticut and my wife's home in Patterson, New Jersey. So this way we could get to see the, the old folk. So you were married in medical, you are I, married. I married uh, in my last month of medical school. Uh, we were given electives uh, in our last year. It's a 12-month 
period, and we were able to take a month uh, off for whatever we wanted, two months off for whatever we wanted to do. So I reserved the last month for getting married, before I started uh, my internship. I interned at the Jewish Hospital of Brooklyn uh, with the idea that I was probably going to go to pediatrics. And they had one of the outstanding pediatric departments in the New York area. Oh, I see. That's how I ended up. And just tell us your wife's name for the record. Yeah. Libby is my wife's name. Her maiden name was Libby Borowski. She came from uh, Patterson, New Jersey. A lovely family. She, uh, I met her in Boston. I was introduced to her by the girlfriend of one of my roommates. And um, we knew each other about a year and a half before we got married. I was in my third year of medical school. And uh, Libby trained as a speech therapist. And during my internship, she <clears throat> went to Hoboken, New Jersey, as a speech therapist. And she uh, taught uh, disadvantaged children and, dis and handicapped children speech. And, uh, the, uh, the rooms were provided by the uh, the people who uh, had the, what would you call it, the, uh, uh, what's the, my thought, uh, they were uh, the union, the union uh, in Hoboken. So I see a lot of bananas brought home. They would give my wife bananas, which I guess dropped out of the boxes. And uh, Accidentally living, or on purpose. Uh, whatever. And, um, we just celebrated our 62nd wedding anniversary on the 25th of May. Congratulations, mm -hmm. Mazel tov. So you were already <clears throat> married when you um, signed up for the uh, oh. Mary plan. Well, what, what happened was that was, discussion yeah. like between the two of you? Yeah. I'm sorry. What? what was that discussion like between the two of you? There was really not much discussion because it was really uh, either I uh, enlisted or they would assign me. So if I, since I had a choice, I chose the Navy. And I uh, let you finish the internship. And I was even able to start my residency before I got my orders. So tell us about that. When, when did you get your orders and what did they say? Okay, I got my orders sometime in 1953. Uh, I was allowed, as I said, to uh, finish my uh, internship, and I was assigned to the Glenview Naval Air Station in Glenview, Illinois. Um, I had a car, so we decided to go to the three A's and find out where Glenview was, because it wasn't on any map. Um, the three A's didn't know where it was, because there was no city then. Today it's a city of about 40,000 people, but at that time it had been made into a naval air station by the government during World War II, and it had consisted of about, I was told, about three or four golf fields and plus other land. So uh, we drove out there uh, from uh, New Jersey <clears throat> and uh, had to ask when we got to Chicago, where it was, we stopped at a gas station. I remember on Michigan Avenue, and they didn't know for sure, but they thought it was a certain area, which we eventually found. So it's near Chicago. Yeah, yeah. it's about north and a little uh, east of Chicago. And, uh, not far from Milwaukee, actually. Um, what kind of military did, training did you Did you have basic training at any time? Nothing. No. That's interesting because uh, when I checked into the medical department, uh, then I became friendly with the corpsman. Um, about a month later, they told me, you know, doctor, uh, without disrespect, you're wearing your insignia on the wrong side. <laughs> so I got no information, no training at all. And they told me, you're a flight surgeon. So my duties were to see the, uh, the uh, 
enlisted men's families, the enlisted men, and also the uh, uh, people that came, the flyers who came on the weekends to uh, get training or retraining as pilots. And uh, I'd go out on ambulance calls in the vicinity if there was a crash. It can't happen once in a while. There'd be a crash on the... Nobody died, I remember. I also was sent out to uh, uh, Arkansas by ambulance once because there was... Uh, two pilots had flameouts. Uh, in other words, they lost their afterburners and on their jets, and they parachuted out. So I went out with, uh, I don't remember exactly who, but I was a little chagrined because President Eisenhower, Eisenhower was coming to the Columbia Naval Air Station and I missed her. <laughs> but anyway, we found the pilots. Uh, they were unharmed, and we brought them back to the Naval Station, and then they were transferred to uh, uh, Naval Station and uh, north of uh, Plainview, the Naval Air Station. Um, so when you got hospital, there, right, right in the hospital, when you there was to back up a bit. When you got there, you were what kind oh. of uniform did you wear? What what did they did they give you anything or did no? You no, we wore our own uniforms. Mm -hmm. The it's interesting. The uh, Navy uh, flight surgeons. Uh, uniform uh, for a daily was a greenish color, unlike the khakis. Um, our formal uniform was the navy blue, and in the summer you wore whites if you... Uh, so I was uh, at the Glenview Naval Air Station from uh, September 1953 to March of 54. And I uh, got orders uh, to report to a uh, ship in Norfolk, Virginia, called the USS Greenwich Bay. Now, the Greenwich Bay was an unusual ship. It was a converted submarine tender. Um, it wasn't uh, going out in action or anything like that. But um, the Korean War, I think, had just about ended at that time, or was over for a while, and uh, it was the only Navy ship painted white. And uh, the reason for that, its mission was to go to the Persian Gulf, carry the flag. That means, in other words, to let the people know in the Persian Gulf that the United States had a, an affinity with them, that the uh, <clears throat> The reason that the uh, United States made this type of uh, entry into Bahrain was because of oil. So while I was on the ship, the first month, a couple of months before we were supposed to go to Bahrain, uh, we had people from the State Department come down and uh, give us the propaganda about why this was such an important mission. Actually, it was a lot of baloney uh, because it was because of the uh, oil interest. Also, I was told by people who had been on the ship that it was the worst possible duty because you and it took you a month to get out there, it took you two months on station, it was bloody hot, and it took you another month to get home, and uh, there was nothing to do out there. Now you were the med were you I was the medical, medical officer. officer. Yeah, Did they you only had one doctor. And did you that have any me. kind of crew that... Yeah, we had 120 men on the ship, and I had a pharmacist mate who happened to be Jewish. <laughs> so we were the medical department. The two of you? The two of us. And... Uh, were you also the Jews on the ship? I'm sorry. Were you the Jewish contingent on the ship? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. There might have been some others, but I never... I didn't stay there very long. And that's, uh, we would go out <clears throat> for uh, maneuvers on a weekly basis, and uh, it was a custom of the captain to invite uh, whoever was the head of a department, and I was the head of the department, for dinner. So I remember we were out one day, and he invited me. He had separate quarters, 
separate dinner. He didn't eat with the uh, with the officers. So I remember going up to his cabin, and uh, he was very polite, very nice. He was a, a, a flight officer. He was um, assigned a ship because they have to put in so much time on sea duty in order to advance in the Naval Air Corps. So uh, I remember the, the dinner was uh, pork chops, which I had no, uh, I had no desire necessarily to eat, but it was there and I, I wasn't put up protest. But I got seasick. It was the first time I was out <laughs> at sea, so I begged his partner had to go down back to my room. So he said, why? He says, I can't understand that, doctor. He says, the sea is as smooth as glass. And it probably was. But at any rate, uh, he never invited me again. Oh dear. And you never told him that Jews don't eat, that don't eat pork? So. No. I had to eat that at various times, but it didn't make any difference to me, really. We do keep a kosher home, by the way, because of my wife's bringing up and insistence, but uh, we do go out. We eat non kosher food. Uh, at any rate, um, in, uh, we got the orders to go to the Persian Gulf, and uh, my wife was pregnant. Mm. So uh, this was in May of, uh, May of 53. 54, May of 54, and uh, I went to the uh, captain, to the executive officer, and um, I asked if I could be flown over to Gibraltar because we were going over with a bunch of ships, carriers, destroyers, cruisers, and uh, a lot of them would split off into various areas. Some would go to England, uh, some would go to the Mediterranean. Uh, some would go to uh, other ports. Uh, a lot of them carried uh, the uh, freshmen from the United States Naval Academy on their summer cruise. And one of the stops was Gibraltar. So I could pick up my ship there because my wife's um, due date and our sailing date were about the same, the end of uh, June. So Captain uh, said, he would check, and that is the executive officer went to the cabin, cabin called, wherever, they said no, can't do it, can't fly over and pick up the ship. There were plenty of doctors on the other ships, and most of the time, most ships didn't even carry medical officers, but we did because we were going to be separated and go to the Persian Gulf. Anyway, when I had to apply for a visa to get into Bahrain, and uh, the executive officer came to me and said, Hirsch, he said, I didn't know you were Jewish. So I said, yeah. He says, I don't know if you can get a visa to go to the Persian Gulf, to go to Bahrain. So we called the captain, the captain didn't know. So we called the medical officer in Norfolk, who incidentally I'd worked for for a couple of weeks before the ship came in, the Greenwich Bay. And he said he didn't know, so they called Washington. Now, previously, I had asked permission to go to Washington to ask if I could be uh, air transported over to Gibraltar, and they told me no. And um, so this time, Washington decided that I should come back to the Personnel Bureau and uh, get uh, information from them, which I did, and I was treated really royally. They really didn't want to make any stink about this. That a United States naval officer couldn't be allowed to get into a foreign country. But the problem was is that if I did go ashore and they found out I was Jewish, I could be in prison. I was told this. Plus the fact that any sailor got hurt or needed medical attention immediately, it would be dangerous for me to go ashore. So they asked me, what do you want? I said, I'd like a ship that's not going anywhere. Uh, my wife is going to have a baby. So I, they said, well, what do you want? I said, an aircraft carrier. I was still a flight surgeon. So they said, all the, that was the best job. I said, all the carriers are filled up. But we can't give you another ship 
called the United States, Northampton, USS Northampton. It was a brand new ship and it was being outfitted to be uh, the command ship for uh, war time in that it had the most elaborate and up-to-date uh, equipment, not only radar but also other intelligence uh, material. I remember it was way down on the sixth deck, below deck. That's how far down it was. And uh, they had, if you went in there, and I was allowed to go in there, they had all the most up-to-date equipment. They had RCA, Westinghouse, and probably some other companies doing all the fitting out the ship. And that's why our sh uh, ship stayed in port until November of uh, 53. Now, um, I, I, I wanted to back up and ask you a couple of things and then come back to this equipment. When, <clears throat> you, um, when you went down to Washington, did, were, did you have to go to the Pentagon? No. The Navy had a uh, personnel department in uh, Anastasia, uh, so I went there, and they were very, very nice to me, as I said, and they said you can have whatever is available. That's not going anywhere. So. Um, actually, regentrifying that part of town right now. Um, back on your ship, you you talked about that and dinner with the captain. Oh, uh, what were your what were your quarters like and your mess and, and the things right. that you did every day? What was that? And, yeah, and quarter, your... I had my own cabin. Uh, I ate with the other officers. Uh, <clears throat> How many officers were there? Compared probably to? about six or seven officers plus the captain. And uh, each department would have a commanding officer. Most of them were high rank, except for the executive officers was a commander. The others were probably lieutenants or lieutenant commanders. And you had an officer in charge of uh, equipment and in charge of uh, all the various departments. And was your medical area um, well stocked? And, uh, uh, well, it was about, this, uh, about the size of half this room. It was like a big closet. And uh, if we had to do any uh, surgical work, uh, the uh, surgical beds were up on the ceiling. They were lowered down, and they were in the wardroom because that was the only big space, really, that uh, we had. Um, incidentally, while I was in Norfolk waiting for the ship, I'd go to the uh, Naval Hospital, try and uh, watch them do a couple of appendectomies. And I also went to the uh, Dental department and watch them do a little bit of dental work because you because were I was the only do... the only one and uh, well finally uh, as I told you left the Greenwich Bay went to the Northampton Northampton was a big ship it was a cruiser and, uh, personnel it could hold about 1,200 men but at the time when I went on the ship it was at about 600 men. And uh, a lot of officers. Must have been 12, 15. Uh, well, it was probably more than that, maybe 20 officers. But uh, department heads were commanders, executive officer was a commander, a captain was a full captain. And your rank at that time? I was a uh, lieutenant, a junior lieutenant. By the time I got off, I would say full lieutenant. So you were one of the junior officers on the ship. Yes, but I was a department head. So uh, with that, I got all the benefits of being a department head. So you had your own quarters? I had my own quarters, yeah. And how big of a crew did you have who worked for you? Uh, I had about 17 men. Yeah. Interesting enough, um, one of the times when the ship was coming out, we went out every day stayed out while they, they worked the equipment and all that, and they were training the crew. Uh, when I came on, there was a captain who was, uh, he was called the Bull, because he was so tough on the bed. 
I didn't have much inter intercourse with him. I, I, the apartment was pretty separate. But the other men really complained. I'm talking about the officers. They really were put to task. Uh, then they got another captain, who uh, were captain weekly, who was the nicest man you could ever meet. And uh, weekly had a different way of treating the, uh, the crew and the officers, which they appreciated. But anyway, there was a lot of work on the ship until uh, November uh, when uh, 53, uh, when uh, we departed from Europe. Did you have um, <clears throat> any medical emergencies or big, big we medical used to, cases? Um, yeah, well, we went out once. We were on maneuvers. They were uh, uh, amphibious maneuvers. And uh, there was a captain, I mean an admiral, on the ship. They had a few admirals on because this was a command ship. So uh, he got what I diagnosed as appendicitis. So I said, I don't think I really should operate on him. Since we're in the States, maybe we should get a surgeon. So the captain said, I agree with you. We got a surgeon, and I helped him. We removed the uh, admiral's appendix. Um, he was on board for the time we were on maneuvers, and then he was transferred to the Naval Hospital, Norfolk. The uh, day that we were to sail uh, for Europe, uh, we, uh, the, the uh, surgeon and I both got an invitation for dinner at the Admiral's house. But I never made it because we sailed and he had a dinner that night. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. What was your mission to Europe? Mission to Europe was carry a flag. And we went to the Mediterranean, and uh, we uh, anchored in uh, a port called Villefranche. Villefranche is a small uh, French town between uh, Monaco and uh, Cannes, Nice, rather, between Nice and Monaco. Uh, the reason we anchored out is because they didn't have port facilities. So we'd have to, whoever went ashore would have to take small boats. Uh, and that was our uh, port for the time that we stayed. In, uh, I mean, we'd come back there from time to time. But at various times, we went to uh, Spain, Italy, Algiers, um, Greece. Um, Gibraltar. Um, we went into Gibraltar, I remember it was very early in the morning, maybe 5 o'clock in the morning. And I got a call that there was a seaman who was ill. Went down and saw him and he had appendicitis. So, what am I going to do? I didn't feel like going to, see, we were going to leave at about 7, 7.30. So I called the Naval Hospital of Gibraltar, British Naval Hospital. And they agreed to take him. So they, we sent him off there. I didn't have to do my uh, surgery there. Subsequently, uh, my major job, besides some other emergencies which I was able to handle, I was trained, were doing circumcisions. So I must have done about 30 circumcisions. On the soldiers? On naval, naval personnel, yeah. No officers, but they're all enlisted men. And the reason, I don't know really. I think it was more a matter of cleanliness. They weren't converting to... No, they weren't reason. converting. <laughs> uh, after a while, uh, my, I had a surgical corpsman, and he wanted to become a doctor. So he thought it would be nice if I let him do some work. So I let him do some of the circumcisions, but I was there. I was there. That could be tricky. Yeah. And one interesting uh, episode. Uh, I had always done many circumcisions, but on babies, while I was an intern and a resident. So um, what, the first guy that came up, first seaman that came up and wanted to have a circumcision done, I wasn't afraid to do it, but there was a question 
what type of suture material you should use. Now, during my internship, I'd use silks for skin, but there was another way you could use cat gun. The difference is that silk gives you a tight uh, approximation. Cat gun would loosen up. So I figured it'd be best to do a perfect job and use silk. The only problem with silk is it doesn't give. So we anesthetized the area locally. I did the surgery, it was fine. I used silk. That night, uh, I was invited by, uh, by the Marine captain and lieutenant to play poker. Um, we were, we used to eat together, and uh, I went down to the poker, somebody's cabin, and I was ahead about $30, $35. I got a call from sickbay, and I was very happy to go, because these guys were playing for a lot, a lot of money. The uh, sailor was in pain, because the stitches wouldn't go. So I remember we had to use emergency measures. Plus the fact when I had to take out stitches, it wasn't easy because they were buried in the skin. So after that, I only used cat gut and everything went fine. I never had any trouble. Now a cat gut lesson. <clears throat> How was medicine in the Navy compared to, you, you had really just come out of medical school, so yep. you were on cutting edge in medical school. Yep. What was, how would you describe medicine in the Navy? Was it was it up to date? Was it lacking? Was it how would you describe it? Well, going back to Glenview Naval Air Station, I remember the captain who was uh, the head of the department. At that time. By the way, it was the captain and myself. That was the department. We used to have a surgeon come down from the Great Lakes uh, Naval Hospital once a week for any surgical problem. Uh, although the ones in between you know, would send up to the Great Lakes. But there were many um, surgical procedures that could be done on an outpatient basis. He would come down. Um, the captain was completely incompetent. Uh, he, was, he was a nice guy, but all the duties went to me. Not that I objected. It wasn't onerous. I was very happy to do what I, whatever I could, whatever I could. But um, he was waiting to get his advocacy. In other words, uh, put his time in, he could retire, and he could retire as a, an admiral, and that was pay. Uh, the equipment we had, we had whatever we needed. I saw a lot of the families of the uh, enlisted men and officers, became very friendly with a number. And their children. And their children. Which is uh, your area? Yeah. And overseas, uh, it was interesting. I didn't find this out until I was relieved on the North Hampton when I left the ship that they had a huge stock of salversan. Salversan was a medication that had um, arsenic, and the reason for it was treatment of syphilis. So this was there before penicillin. Wow. Yeah. So that was stock. But we used penicillin if we had to use anything. The equipment we had was up to date. Uh, we had an x-ray machine on the Northampton. We didn't have it on the Greenwich Bay. Uh, we had surgical setups. had all the surgical equipment we needed for uh, surgery. Um, I think it was quite satisfactory. And were your naval crew on the Northampton <clears throat> well trained? They were well trained. I had, a, I had a chief petty officer who was in charge of the department under me. And as I say, we had 17 corpsmen. So, uh, and they were trained. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I wasn't in sick bay, I had certain hours, they were in sick bay, had other duties. Uh, the men would come up and they would take care of them for colds and, you know, minor things. Uh, but when they had a problem, they would call me even was it sick day hours. And that way we used to get the uh, best pies, the best treats from the bakery. Because <laughs> they wanted to make sure they had a good name. <laughs>
part. So there were perks. Perks. Back to the Northampton in the in the <clears throat> Mediterranean, the slogan is "Join the Navy and see the world." Did you feel like you really got to see places yeah, you I never did. would yeah. have? Uh, actually, I was told that it was a ten thousand dollar cruise because the war was over and we were going from port to port. Uh, most of the men were well. Uh, we didn't have the worry of a, being shipped off to a, a battle field or anything like that, or to a war station. So yeah, the morale was good, uh, the men were happy, they were able to get mail, they had shore leave. Uh, talking about shore leave, um, in um, when we first came into Villefranche, the men had shore leave. Uh, in those days, they used to pass out penicillin pills. So they came, men came back, and a few days later, had 60 cases of treat of gonorrhea. <laughs> so the treatment was pretty easy, it was penicillin. By contrast, we went to Algiers, and, uh, in Algeria. And uh, the first night out, I learned that a lot of the men were attacked uh, by Algerians. Uh, and they, the sailors kept their cigarettes, their wallet, very often in their pocket on their breast. And they were actually had men run over and snatch stuff out of their pockets and slash them. So we had a number of people that were cut up. But I think I had two cases of gonorrhea in Algiers. Of that uh, I also had an interesting. Uh, several times we had to go to uh, the Mediterranean. We, had, we were called to submarines, go down and make uh, see sick uh, sailors or officers. And we took on a couple of times. We took on men who had appendicitis. So they would come from the submarine to your ship. You didn't have to go into. No, the we transferred them to uh, uh, carriers. Had surgeons. So you did end up doing a few appendectomies. Well, actually, no. Uh, they were done on the carrier. Okay. The only appendectomy I assisted in was one in Norfolk. Uh, then, during our stay, in uh, shortly after we got to uh, uh, France, uh, the admiral came aboard. So it became the command ship for the Sixth Fleet. So we carried the flag. And then I became the fleet medical officer. That only lasted for a short time. Because <laughs> then they brought on a surgeon. And he was senior. He was a lieutenant commander. So I guess he was a fleet surgeon. We never had any trouble. Didn't make any difference, what you would call uh, One interesting experience in Algiers, at that time it was run by France. So we're invited to the Governor General of Algiers' home. It was a palace. And I remember walking in there with the uh, Lieutenant Commander, who was a surgeon, we were invited uh, to a reception. And they had these uh, uh, blacks, uh, soldiers, uh, in, in the guard that you think of in, in Arabia, with synagogues, you know, over their uh, and we walked under this passage. That was the night, too, when we got called out to a, a guy in a submarine who had appendicitis. So we missed most of the party. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, there wasn't anything major that happened. I saw a lot of the uh, personnel, the families, uh, the uh, Sixth Fleet, because they were allowed to bring their families over because they were going to be stationed there for six months. Mm -hmm. So the Navy let them bring uh, their families over. I, I met the, uh, the wife of the uh, captain and his two daughters. And even after I left the service, I used to get um, Christmas cards from him. We became very friendly. Did you keep up with any other people that you were um, uh, When I went into practice, I got a call one day for a house call. A woman had had a birth and she went home 
And uh, so those days we made plenty of house calls. I went to see the newborn. It turns out he had gotten in touch with me, called me to be the pediatrician because he remembered me. He was a sailor on the ship. But uh, yeah, I did have one good friend. Uh, I went to his wedding. Subsequently, we lost touch. Right, right. What <clears throat> was your commitment for the very plan? It was two years. Two years. Yeah. So, um, so that was a that was really a very good deal for you. It was a good deal. Right, right. Um, you were. I, mean, I just wanted to ask you one thing about Europe. You were in the Mediterranean areas in the fifties, yes. really shortly after World War Two. What, yeah. were, what was what were those countries like? Well, <clears throat> in France. Uh, I had an opportunity to go to uh, Monte Carlo and uh, we were maybe 15-20 minutes away and I would go there because ships would come in, they had no medical officer. They were uh, destroyers and I remember going there at Christmas time, a lot of destroyers came in and I did physical exams for the officers. Uh, they had to have them every year. Um, so a number of us went to the uh, casino and the people were poor. Uh, they, their bets were small, they carried uh, little booklets and they kept track of the numbers for the roulette wheels. Uh, you could buy a great meal in the uh, casino, a special uh, room for dinner for an extra dollar equivalent, you could go into that room and for less than two dollars you get a banquet. Uh, the, uh, the franc, I think it was devalued by about a third. And this was so uh, wherever we went, devaluation. But the people were poor, uh, comparatively. Was there any place that you said, and when you left that area, you said, I'm going to go back and make sure I have more time to spend there? Well, I enjoyed the Riviera area, uh, so I went back to my wife subsequently. And speaking of your wife, so how long were you separated from her? And Two years. So you did Well, not fully. I was separated one time from November, of, um, I guess it would be 54 to March of uh, 55. And how did you, and you missed the birth of your child? No, oh, I was there. there. Yeah, we I was there. there. Yeah. Right there. But then you left shortly yes. after. Yeah. How, how did you communicate? By mail. By mail. I don't remember ever being able to talk to her on the phone. But we sent a lot of mail. She tells me she still has the, the letters. Oh. So, uh, so were they like every day or? Plenty of letters, at least four or five a week probably. Right. I'm sure she wrote to me more, even more often than that. Did you get, <clears throat> so you didn't see her at all in that time? No, that's right, for about six months. So um, tell us about coming home. Came home, uh, the ship was loaded with a gift from all the sailors, myself included. We were able through uh, ship stores to buy uh, China, um, cigarettes, cameras, watches. So uh, my first trip, uh, first trip that I made, I bought um, table, tablecloths. In Spain. That was interesting. Um, when we were in Gibraltar, I was told that uh, you could buy wonderful uh, uh, woolen material and have it made into suits in uh, Spain. So I did. I went ashore and I bought uh, material for a couple of suits. And then when we got to Spain, I was able to go ashore. And I went to a tailor and they gave me about three fittings. And I had two suits made up. Also, uh, my mother-in-law had wanted uh, tablecloths uh, for her uh, two daughter-in-laws and my uh, her daughter. So uh, 
some of the women that came aboard of the ship, by the way, <clears throat> wherever we went, there was like an open house on the ship so that uh, various dignitaries came aboard and also young ladies came aboard from the upper class. And uh, I asked one of these ladies about uh, tablecloths and she went with me to this place. And uh, I remember uh, they had tablecloths up on the wall and on, uh, uh, call it uh, like screens. And they press a button and the tablecloth would come down and there would be napkins on it so you could see the setting. So I was able to buy the tablecloth. Do you have any of them? Yeah, Being my so wife happy. does. And, her brothers passed away, but the family has. I also bought uh, watches for a couple of uncles. Uh, I bought other things I don't remember, but I didn't buy much for myself. On a subsequent trip, I bought a set of Wedgwood china. This time I knew what was going on. I bought uh, sweater sets for uh, family and my wife, uh, who were uh, cashmere, the finest that they had. Bought cigarettes, liquor, but I also bought about four or five sets of the china, uh, Wedgwood. So I remember when I got off the ship, the sailors were up on top telling me, we have to rebalance the <laughs> ship because of the, what I took off. <laughs> But it was all legitimate. You had. No, it wasn't legitimate, I must confess. But uh, it was legitimate that nobody bought it. Right. While you were out on the ship, did you celebrate any Jewish holidays? No. No. Uh, there was no facilities. Uh, I actually didn't know. I knew one guy who was Jewish. I remember he came from New York. We became friends, but I never kept in touch. Um, your homecoming, I mean, there's all the, think of the ship coming in and the flags and the music yes. and all that. Uh, what was the mood back in the, in the States when you got there? It was very happy. Uh, no, no problems in the family at the time. Everybody was reasonably young. Uh, I remember my wife came aboard. I hadn't seen my daughter, actually, for well over the six months. So I put my arms out to take her, she wouldn't go to me. So she was crying. So I realized as a, as a pediatrician, this is quite, quite normal. I didn't get upset or anything like that. And within a few months, when I was finally discharged, uh, she still loves me. So, well, <laughs> I, would, I would hope so. What happened after your discharge? How did you uh, readjust to civilian life? Yeah, I went back and got my appointment back in the hospital. I and finished where was uh, this? two years. In, in Brooklyn? In Brooklyn. I finished two years as uh, a senior resident. And then I was uh, chief resident for a part of the time, six months. And then I went into practice with uh, one of the residents who was a co chief resident. In my first year, of residency, I was a two-year resident. Second year, they made us co-chiefs. So one of us ran uh, the nurseries for six months, and the other one went, ran the uh, floor. That is where the inpatients were. And we would exchange duties uh, during, those, during that year. I went to practice with him and another man. It was probably the first three-man partnership in Brooklyn, if not in God knows where, because most of the doctors practice solo. And I know that the most anybody had was another doctor with them. This is three men, and eventually we had five men. So at one time it was the largest uh, pediatric practice in Brooklyn. And uh, we also developed a, uh, an office in Staten Island. So we gave ourselves the name of Brook Island, and, uh, and we had a pretty complete practice. We did allergy. I went to the hospital and went to Arizona, 
to learn allergy treatment. Um, we learned uh, use the x-ray to be able to take a chest x-ray. We brought in laboratory equipment. Some, you know, simple stuff that was readily available. So the patient came to us. We could do a mono test. We could do a blood count. We could do a sed rate. We brought in eyesight uh, to eye vision screen. We could do um, uh, hearing tests. So we expanded as much as we could to give the patients a really complete uh, screening. Do you want to put it that way? Right. And how much did a physical exam cost for a child? Uh, well, when I first started in practice, it was five dollars per visit. Uh, when I went out on house call, and if I gave a shot, it was seven dollars. Later, uh, when I left practice, uh, I think our visits were forty dollars. That was after almost forty years. Oh, oh so, so you were in <clears throat> Brooklyn, in, in this Brooklyn, practice, and you lived in Brooklyn. I lived in Brooklyn, in the area called uh, Manhattan Beach, which was uh, right on the ocean. It was near uh, Sheepshead Bay, and uh, that was a really enjoyable time, too, because uh, it was a lovely area to live in. Uh, and you had other children? We, oh, yeah. Three children, a daughter and two sons. Uh, my daughter graduated from Pratt. She also had uh, gone out and spent one year in California at uh, Berkeley, and uh, she eventually married a gentleman from Mexico who uh, was Jewish, uh, who lived in Mexico City. The wedding was in New York, and they settled in Acapulco, and they had a business there for many years. Um, then eventually um, they moved to the east coast of Mexico, a place called uh, uh, Playa del Carmen, which is about a, a, an hour south of Cancun. And there they uh, are in real estate, and also my son in law uh, uh, does uh, work with hotels providing uh, 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 sea, not sea, but water sports. Mm -hmm. Uh, two two, they have two children. One is a uh, daughter who was learning to be a chef. And the other just boy who just got married last uh, February and is in the financial business in uh, uh, New York. And your sons? The sons, uh, the oldest son, David, um, graduated from Tufts and decided to go to California for law school and uh, married. Uh, three children, girls. Uh, he became religious, and uh, was his family, family moved into was religious. But his wife says he's more religious than they are. <laughs> the uh, David's a lawyer. He does, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He does uh, law related to uh, buildings, homes, stuff like that. Where they have uh, <coughs> problems with construction. Uh, my other son, Andrew, uh, went to the University of Rochester, and then he went to uh, George Washington University Law School, and he went into practice with a friend, and uh, they finally ended up with their own practice, took in other people, a very successful career. Unfortunately, developed a, a brain tumor about three, four years ago, or five years ago, and uh, passed away about three years ago and left a wife with uh, three boys. So uh, those boys, uh, one is starting Ithaca College in, uh, in the fall, one is a junior in high school, the other is a freshman in high school. My uh, three granddaughters in California, uh, one is a graduate of the University of Maryland with honors and uh, she's a nurse. She has a job, a full-time nurse at uh, uh, 
in, in uh, <coughs> Los Angeles. And uh, second one, uh, the oldest one, uh, graduated from Brandeis, and uh, she's in the uh, um, catering business. Uh, she goes all over. Uh, they do a lot of work with the film people. They go to uh, Colorado for the film festivals. I think she's even been in Europe. Oh, she's been in Mexico for uh, catering jobs. She got married in August of last year. Uh, the uh, youngest graduated from the University of Wisconsin, and she's doing teaching. Um, I think that covers. Well, so you did get one medical person, but no military people. No. no. Luckily, they didn't have to. Um, how did you get to Connecticut from Brooklyn? Um, my wife wanted to get out of uh, Brooklyn. It was changing. Uh, the uh, Russians had come in, and they weren't really very nice people. Uh, they had a lot of money, and they were buying up the area. And they weren't friendly. Uh, they wouldn't recognize you. Uh, they started building stores, which they were their prerogative. But uh, you weren't very, they weren't very friendly when you came in there. Uh, <clears throat> and also, she told me she never wanted to live in Brooklyn. <laughs> she did it because it was something that I really thought would be good for us. She was happy there, but didn't really want to live there. Now, once my youngest son, Andy, uh, moved to uh, Larchmont, she thought it would be a good idea to come to some place. We weren't be too close, but not that far away. Also, we were doing a lot of babysitting because I retired in '93. Was the year he married, and they moved up to Larchmont, probably around uh, 19, oh, 1900. I mean, 2000. So um, we she looked around. She found we wanted a. Uh, a uh, house that was one story, you know, one story, mm -hmm. and a ranch. So that's how we ended up in Stanford. Wow. So it, just to look back at your military experience, did um, did you did the your time as a doctor in the military impact your views about medicine or your practice of medicine in any way? Well, I think the main thing. It uh, did for me to really realize uh, the difference of the ranks of different people, social ranks, and also at the time uh, the blacks were segregated in Norfolk. So when I came home from Norfolk, I'd be on a ship that would get us <coughs> to Kiptapeak, which was the ferry. And uh, all the facilities were uh, separate for blacks and whites. Once I got on the uh, bus to keep the feet, it changed. But I realized how important it was to take in each individual as an individual, not to treat them as by rank or, uh, or any quality except them as, as people. Uh, I think it gave me more compassion for people. I saw a guy separate from their families. Uh, I heard stories about what they had gone through because a lot of these guys had been in Korea or had other assignments on ships. Uh, they gone through hardships. Uh, I was really fortunate. One thing too, I really thought that the Navy could have been doing a better job. There was no preparation for me as a medical officer. I remember while I was waiting to get on to the Greenwich Bay, when I first transferred, I worked in the uh, captain, the medical office in Norfolk, and I suggested to him, there's no manual for medical officers. So I started working on a manual 
I don't know if they ever made one, but there was no preparation, uh, an introduction for medical officers. I was assigned to be a flight surgeon, but, but it, I didn't have any uh, training as a flight surgeon. And there is a lot of training that goes into that, particularly today. I should hope that, uh, I'm sure they do, flight surgeon. The only benefit I got out of being a flight surgeon was occasionally I got a trip from Chicago, from Columbia, to New York on a plane, <laughs> but, but otherwise. <laughs> Uh, but, not, not too many ships but in I, the Midwest. Uh, yeah. I could say that uh, my experience was a pleasant one. I enjoyed it. I thought I gave some service uh, by taking care of babies and children. That I, I think the service people in particular uh, want, people, want to help their children. Uh, I think more than anything else, they were appreciative of the fact somebody was interested and knew something about uh, pediatrics. Otherwise. Well, Dr. Hirsch Lebo, thank you for your service thank and you. thank you for this interview. Thank you. I think you're doing a very wonderful job interviewing veterans. Thank you.